So if I were to show you a way to not allow past events to hold you back, might that change your life for the better? Yeah. yeah. Imagine if I said you could have access to inner wisdom on demand. That's quite a concept, isn't it? Inner wisdom on demand to make important decisions. Would that be of interest to you? And how would you like me to show you a way to move from reactivity to proactivity in the moment? Sound good? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. I'm in the right ceremony and celebration. <laughs> this is the right day and time. Wonderful. All right. I'm going to share three things with you today. First, I'm going to tell you my story. Then I'm going to dispel a huge myth about alternative healing, which is what I do, and emotional clearing modalities that can keep people from trying new things and uh, so they can feel more empowered and fulfilled. And then third, I'm going to give you three keys or kind of action steps, quick start action steps that can get you freed up to have some immediate results in terms of bringing up the past at last for yourself. All right. Sound good? Yep. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. First, a quick synopsis of my story. Um, this is just a real quickie and later on, I'm gonna go into more detail with it. So, although my story might be different from yours and I'm sure it will be, um, I likely felt similar to many of you and to many of you. Um, I, you might've felt like old dramas and traumas are still sitting on your shoulder or kicking around behind you or influencing your thoughts, your feelings, your actions and maybe you don't want that to happen anymore. Well, I grew up in that energy. My parents were Holocaust survivors. They endured unimaginable traumas and dramas, and they came to this country to start over again. And as a result of their experiences, I was born with inherited trauma. And then war was heaped on over the years, being their child, middle child of three. Uh, I went off at some point. I was. 21 on my own heroine's healing journey. And I was really hell bent on finding out how I could heal myself. And I've been doing that for 35 years. And so that is the really short version. You'll get a longer version later. Um, I want to bust uh, the biggest myth about um, using transformational hypnosis and emotional and energy clearing techniques that I hear from people. And I'll tell you more about the other ones, but this is kind of the granddaddy. Um, and this one is that you can't change a leopard's stripes. You're paying attention. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, leopards don't have stripes. Zebras do. But seriously, some people believe that you can't change what happened to you in the past. It happened, you suffered, end of story. Deal with it, right? That's kind of a societal attitude. And then this can get compounded with what you're born with is just your lot in life. So you're stuck with what you got and nothing's going to change that. And I don't know about you, but it makes me want to pass the cyanide cocktail when I hear stuff like that. So I want to give you three action steps now. These are like fast start things that will help you in the direction of self-discovery and self-healing. And I promise you the third one is going to be wonderful. I can't wait to get you started there, but I got to get through the whole talk to get this. Okay. Does that sound good too? Yeah. All right. We're in the right place then. And I'm going to continue. Now, um, where is he? There he is. Mike was kind enough to say that because this is a long talk, and this talk is usually like an hour and a half, uh, that we're going to condense it into 30 minutes. I have a little post-it thing here. If anybody wants this, we'll leave this here. If you have a question, and then you can fold it up, and you can, maybe can we toss it in this bowl, and I'll pick it up at the end? Okay, great. So I might even answer those questions while I'm talking. Um, but you can certainly come up to me afterwards and ask. And those of you online, feel free to go to troywellness.com and submit your information and I'll get back in touch with you if you have a question. All right, so here's my story. We all have a story. I even wrote a song about stories, but I'm not gonna do that right now. <laughs> but the purpose is to show you that if my parents and I, and my two siblings as well, the next generation, 
the first generation in this country with inherited and then compounded developed trauma growing up with my parents and their experience can live full productive lives and turn horror into healing. We all can. That's the real undercurrent message here. So it's kind of unusual to have both parents be Holocaust survivors. I've heard this story before that people might have one or the other. Um, my parents knew each other before the war. Uh, they were uh, teens that would come together and their parents would have little Sunday soirees for them with a big megaphone and do pastries and coffee and tea so they could have some normalcy as all hell was breaking loose. Curfews were being put on the Jews in Prague, which is where my mother was. And my father would come over from Dresden to these events, kind of like New Hope and Lambertville, they were that close. And uh, they, they kind of liked each other. My mother thought my dad was a bit of a snob. My father thought my mother was kind of a little giggly girl, but they certainly made an impression on each other. So they did know each other ahead of time. Now, my mom's story is that she was really the wealthy child, daughter of two uh, cultured frog adults. Her father was a pediatrician. Her mother was, well, she fancied herself a concert pianist. My cousin thought otherwise, but that's, that's a family story that I'll leave alone. Um, and uh, my mother was raised by, by a governess. My, my grandmother, whom I never met, was very involved with her life. They owned lumber mills, and so they were in business as well. So they had a, a lot. And then a lot to lose as it all got taken away. And my mother had an older brother, Gerhard, whom she adored, who was this big, and she's always able to say, that's where you got your height. Um, and um, so they had quite a happy, healthy, musical cultured life before the war. Uh, my great uncle Max, my mother's father's brother, felt as the the news was churning up that something really evil was about to happen. And his gut told him to get out of Dodge. And he went against my great grandmother's wishes, who said, as a matriarch of the family, nobody's leaving. The Hitler thing is baloney and we're all gonna stay. And he left. He went to America, thank God because there was a family line that continued as a result of his trusting, his instinct. There's a message there for you too. My mother was <clears throat> in three concentration camps, from 17 to 21 years old. She was in Auschwitz. She survived Auschwitz. I never understood how. Somehow she did not get selected for the line that went to the gas chambers. She was in Terezin, transported to Dresdenstadt, which was the musical camp that the, uh, the Nazis had put together to fool Americans in the Red Cross, in particular, that this was a nice place to go. And they somehow managed to draft artists, musicians, conductors, composers, freewheeling thinkers, uh, you know, intellectuals to this camp and force them to put on operas and uh, musical compositions and entertain the Nazis and the other people they would bring in to see these shows. What nobody knew was that tens of thousands of people were starving and dying in terrorism. My mother managed to survive that too. And the third camp was towards the end of the war. It's probably 1944 or so. And she was in Christian Schott. And the war was ending, the Allied forces were coming in, there was going to be, uh, you know, an end of this war that had affected the world on so many fronts. <clears throat> and um, what ended up happening is uh, she was being marched along with hundreds of other inmates, prisoners, uh, away from the Germans. So they had them on a forced march through the woods. It was in the middle of the winter. People were freezing and dying and starving. And if you dropped, you died. And she watched that and witnessed that. And she had a friend that she made who was a few years older than her, 
<clears throat> British girl named Carmen. Maybe she wasn't British. She ended up moving to England. And they decided together that they were going to escape. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember the ardor of being 19, 20, 21, 22, and realizing, seeing in front of me, you know, that something big was going to happen and I had to rise to the occasion, but I never had to do it in this life in such a dramatic way. So they set about to prepare uh, for this experience. And my mother and Carmen took out the patch on the back of their black coats, their thin black coats that somehow they survived with in these winters, tore out that Star of David so that it was just a black patch. They somehow got a hold of, uh, she called it a styptic pencil, but it couldn't have been, it must have been something with acid with the intent to burn the tattoos out of their arms when they left. And they saved stale bread and somehow water for three days. They starved themselves for three days when they were already in great malnourished condition to have something for the escape. They waited until roll call happened. They heard their names. They had stood at the end of the line. It was getting dark. And as they said, yes, yes, here, here, or whatever they said, they then turned their backs and ran like the Dickens to get out of there towards the forest. As they ran, they ran as far as they could. It was coming to be nighttime. They burned the number out of their arms. Still don't know how that happened, but she always had a really bad scar here, whereas my father had his numbers tattooed on his arm. And the next morning, they awakened after huddling with each other to keep warm and surviving during the night and started to walk. I have no idea how they even knew how to get to Prague. It's not like they had a compass or they, you know, had their iPhone to look up half west. But somehow they figured it out. And as they were walking on the road, which they had to do at some point, an SS man came up on a motorcycle and said, Fräuleins! And they stopped and they froze in their tracks. And they looked and they realized, this is probably it. And he said, where are you going? And they stopped and they looked at him and they said, Carmen was the one. She stepped up into her full power. I can feel it now. Her complete indignation. This is my life and you are not going to take it. Sorry, I didn't think that was going to happen. And she stood up to him and he backed down because she was so adamant. She told him that she and they were sisters, not true. She told him that they were uh, German Fräuleins. Yes, they were German Fräuleins and that their homes had been firebombed and their papers were lost. And so they could not produce papers for him. And he said, well, and then he went back at it again and she got even more indignant and adamant. And he said, well, then you must go around the corner. There is an outpost there and you must get papers because you can't walk around in Germany right now like this without papers. You're gonna get caught again and you're gonna get thrown in a camp somewhere. So they managed to endear themselves to him. Off he went on his motorcycle, off they went in complete opposite direction, running for their lives. And within days, they found themselves in Prague. Now, what were they gonna do then? Because the war was still going on. Fortunately, they both had a really good command of German. My mother was Czech, but they had to learn German in school. I'm sure she was grateful for that for the rest of her life, but she never, ever spoke it at home. So off they went to Prague. My mother had had some relatives who uh, had married into the family who were Christian. So they were not taken. Their partners were. And so she went to them and they produced papers for her. Documents that said she was German. And she somehow found a job as a governess to uh, a family with a mother, father, baby, and grandmother. 
And there she stayed for the next year, speaking German and feigning to be a German governess. The day finally came when the war ended and the bells were ringing in the town square. And you could hear the excited voices of people running to the town square where everyone came together. Again, emotional. And she wanted to leave. But the woman was away, the baby was there, and the grandmother said, where do you think you're going? You can't leave this child. And she said, oh, yes, I can. I am a Jewish Holocaust survivor. I have been feigning to be a governess this year against my will but to survive. And now I'm leaving. And she tried to block the door. And my mother had already grabbed, packed her belongings in a satchel. And she pushed away past her and ran on into the town square. Well, she arrived there and people were singing and dancing and eating the last bits of chocolate. And it was quite a celebration. And she went in to celebrate with them, this town that had been her home. And they all looked at her and they laughed. And then some of the people who knew her because she would roll the baby around and go to the market and she made, you know, kind of acquaintanceship connections with people, started pointing at her and saying, no, you, you're not Czech, you're German. And she realized she'd done such a good job speaking German and acting like a German woman that now she had to go prove it. So she went back to her relatives and she got other papers that showed who she was before she got the false papers. So, she then went to live with her grandmother, who somehow managed to survive the war. And I really don't understand this either. There were gaps in this story. But my great-grandmother, who was the matriarch who said, nobody's leaving, this isn't happening, um, lived in an apartment above the lumber mills in Prague, in the country of Prague. And Somehow they didn't come for her there. Maybe they thought it was a factory and nobody was living there, but she lived her life through the war without being found out. So she went there um, and she lived with her for a while and took care of her a little bit. And then one day my mother was in the streets of Prague, walking on the cobblestone and she got on a cable car to go from one place to the next. And it was open and she looked out and there she saw on the street, Max Burns, my father. And she was floored because nobody was alive, especially the men and not many Jewish men. They all were pretty much gone at that point because they'd been in concentration camps and they'd also been in labor camps and they worked them to death. And she shouted his name, he shouted back. And it was, I always thought of it as a Dr. Shivanga moment. I was, but it felt that way to me. And they agreed to meet at the JCC. So they met, they started to date. I don't know that they would have chosen each other in a world that was greatly populated with other men and women, but they were all they had. And my father at one point went to my great grandmother to ask her permission to marry his, his uh, girlfriend. And she said, no, you cannot marry her. You have nothing. What do you have to offer my granddaughter? This, the same grandmother who kept everyone from leaving and had to live with the fact the rest of her life that she had destroyed her entire family line. The woman had chutzpah. But I get where she was coming from. She wanted the best for her granddaughter. So he decided, being the strong-headed Capricorn, self-sourcing kind of personality that he was, to contact his relatives, the Bernsteins in New York. And they agreed to give him an affidavit and get him papers, which meant they would vouch for him to have work when he came to this country. So he went back to great-grandmother. And of course she said, yeah. yes, <laughs> of course she said yes. He had something to give his, uh, her granddaughter. So they off they went uh, to live in America. Uh, and that was her story. My father's was was different. His was more, he was more of a working class guy, 
came from a family of six, four kids. They lived in Dresden, which was a beautiful city, I'm told, before the war, before uh, Great Britain bombed it. And uh, they had a catering deli butcher shop. That's how they survived. And one day as things were heating up and some of the shopkeepers were starting to get threatened and things were getting very uncomfortable, they got word that one of the sons was going to be taken away in the morning. And the whole family packed up everything they had overnight in this one family car and left. Now for them, the leaving was kind of like, as I said earlier, going from Lambertville to New Hope, not a big ride because Dresden and Prague were so close. But still, they had to go into a new country. They were immigrants suddenly. They had no money. They had no access to their banks. They had no work. They had nothing but each other. They looked to relatives for help. They didn't really want to help them. I don't know. No, maybe they couldn't. And within a year, Hitler was coming into Prague and Prague was taken, invaded and taken over. So he was sent to the Lodz ghetto, which historically was a horrific place to be. And in the ghetto, there was apparently a schoolhouse and all of these people came in from the trains. They put them in the schoolhouse and he quickly looked around and realized there was no food, there was no water, there was no place to sleep, there was no sanitation. They were all going to die there. And they must have known this because it was kind of like door number one or door number two. You're going to die here. You have the possibility of life over here. So when some SS men came and dangled a carrot to go with him, them, he went. He was told that there would be food, there would be water, they'd have a place to sleep, there'd be sanitation, they'd be comfortable, but they'd have to work hard. And he went. He arrived there to find that the conditions were horrific. And they had clearly lied. They just wanted a workforce. So he continued to work throughout the war in freezing temperatures. He told me once he worked in ice cold water in a river up to his mid calves all day long, day after day after day. It was a wonder he had any feeling in his feet. He was shot at, uh, he was starved. They did dangerous jobs that none of us would have taken. They weren't trained for them. They didn't really care, they died. Just get another 10 men to replace them. He was hit in the head, which left him with migraines and nightmares. It continued when he came to America for many years. And then finally, the war was over. And he got liberated too. He may have been in Dachau, that was not clear to me. My father never talked about this until really the end of his life. And I sat down with a book I had bought. I said, Dad, I'll write down your story because I don't think anybody else is going to do it. And I believe he told me that he had a quick foray through Dachau, another death camp, and survived. Both of my parents, the designated survivors to start a family and continue the family line. It was really a miracle. So he was, uh, they were liberated by the Allied forces. Um, they took them all to seven boats that were supposed to take them to the next place and then start to disseminate them to different countries so they could start all over again. And out of the blue, <clears throat> bombing started happening of these seven ships that were filled with Holocaust survivors. They'd made it this far and somebody was bombing them out of the water. Five out of seven of those ships were, were bombed to oblivion. And my father watched as he was on one of the two that were not bombed. They realized after the fact, I, again, another, I don't know how, that they had made a mistake and they stopped. And so he managed to survive. This was an international incident and a real scar on the Allied forces record at that point at the end of the war. So you know where the story picks up. They found each other, they started dating, they married, they came to this country. My life with them was not easy. 
I was the middle of three children. My mother was traumatized. She was angry. She raged. She yelled. She screamed. She hit. She didn't understand this wild and crazy 60s and 70s culture of drugs, sex, and rock and roll. Although, admittedly, we could get away with a lot because it was like not in their framework of reference, you know, for us and our kids. And yeah, I know what you're doing, you know. But she didn't really understand it. And I was a creative, expressive, spiritual child with many artistic musical talents. Um, and other than being allowed to join the school choir, I was not indulged. They were not interested. Not so good at math or science, uh, but I was a natural with English, with history, with art, with music, language, with psychology. And it was hard to have strict, mistrusting, very tight parents who were unable to fit in easily with my friends' parents. When it's time to go to college, I wanted to be a therapist. My father said, no way, Jose, you're not going to come home and therapize us. And it, he was scared of that. Um, and he had also judged my mother for needing psychiatric help. He was very proud of himself that he didn't need to get his head shrunk, you know, to get along. I went to nursing school kind of being forced to go. And the good news was I learned a lot about the body and healing and medicine and illness. But the bad news was I was completely disgusted and disillusioned was seeing people coming in with one illness and going out with two other side effect oriented illnesses with what I later came to be known as iatrogenic caused disease. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a place for medicine, surgery, and medication. But I was not seeing that it was helping many of my patients. Nobody was talking to them about lifestyle or what had happened them two years before they got their cancer or why they had a heart attack because their heart was broken because their son just got in a car accident and couldn't function the rest of his life. Nobody was talking about that. So I left nursing school uh, in a state of full-blown hives. I had enough respiratory infection, took antibiotics, penicillin, and went. It was frightening how I looked. And I couldn't go to school, thankfully. So out I was. And while we were in school, there was a very big deal thing that would happen. Nurses every night would do PM care with their patients. Any idea what that is? Everybody got a, a massage. Everybody got a back rub in the day, right? Doesn't that make sense? You've been poked and prodded at and taken things, and gone to physical therapy, you're in pain. And now somebody's like calming you down and soothing your nervous system and touching you. Yeah, I was really good at that. So I went and started my own massage practice. I did that for 23 years. I went to Rosemont College, did their holistic health certification program, learned reflexology, studied that, taught it. But I kept looking for this underlying reason because I was really good at taking this stuff off the boulders and the shoulders and the pain in the back and the pain in the neck. We got to know what that was. Who's the pain in your neck, right? But it kept coming back. Same place, same stuff, same energy. And I started to put out to the universe, universe, you got to show me a better way to deal with this. I don't mind being a technician. I was good at it, but I felt like there was something more. So I put it out. And one day I went to a yard sale. And while there, I picked up this little book that said Alchemy Hypnosis. It was a little yellow book written by David Quigley. And I read it standing there in 15 minutes. I was so juiced and jazzed by what I saw. He had created a system of working with the inner child, the inner family, running and changing things, inner guidance, working with your inner healer that really could bypass the conscious mind, get into the subconscious and really make a difference. So I saved up all my dollars. I called them and I went out and studied with them. And in 1988, I became an alchemy hypnotist. And while I was there, I learned something very important that will deal with one of the myths I'm gonna talk about soon. And that is that past, present, and future coexist simultaneously when you're in a state of trance. I'll say that again. Past, present, and future exist at the same time when you're in a trance state. That means that you can go into a trance state and you can access stuff from the past and you can run and change it. That changes your reality now and it creates many new opportunities 
to live the way you want to live in the future. That was so exciting to me that I knew I was in the right place. I had a lot of past life regression experiences along the way at that training with Native American spirituality. I went into a sweat lodge and my, my grandfather Paul came to me who I was named for. Pauline is my middle name. I don't tell many people. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he told me, you don't have to be a healer. No, you really don't have to do this. And I said, oh, no, I do. I feel that I am called. This is what I have agreed to do this life. So he ended up backing down. And off I went on my heroine's self-healing journey for the next three decades, studying everything I could get my hands on to learn how to heal body, mind, and spirit so that we really could release dramas and traumas on that core level that would make a difference. And I got certified in a ton of things. A lot of them were mentioned. And pranic healing was the most recent one, along with shamanic healing, that added in a whole nother level of understanding of the chakra system and how our energy bodies make a big difference in how we show up and how we feel. I became an ordained interfaith minister of spiritual counseling in the new seminary. And then at 31, I started writing songs that took a stand for people to planet at peace. Everything I did was in alignment with my purpose. I invalidated it for years because it wasn't, I wasn't a doctor and then sort of PhD in that. And finally, I had to come to terms with the fact that I am here because I chose my purpose is to heal myself and to help other people heal themselves. And it's an honorable mission. It wasn't really approved of in my family of origin. It hasn't, you know, made me wealthy sitting on a hill in a mansion somewhere, but it is in alignment with my true purpose. Now, when I took everything that I've learned, I put it together and I realized that I could take the best of it all and create my own method to really kind of streamline, kind of like Gary Craig did with EFT when he studied it from Roger Callahan with a big body of work. Gary Craig created the smaller shortcut version. I can't say the sessions are shortcut because they tend to go long but we really do deep dive work. But here's what's involved with my Heal the Cause of Mastery Method. First, we reveal what's going on, and that happens through muscle testing. And I love talking to a crowd like this because most of you probably have some idea of what that is. It's a way of asking the body what its truth is, and the body acts as a lie detector, strong or weak, yes or no. So we reveal what's going on. We find out what the trapped emotion is. Where is it stuck in the body's meridian or energy system? What's the story? Who was there? What happened? And most important of all, what's the takeaway belief that's still running the show from your back brain that keeps you up at night, that tells you nasty things about yourself during the day, that keeps you from living that life and that dream that you really want? Then we remove it and we remove it with some remarkable tools with hypnosis, the alchemy hypnosis I talked about running and changing things. Cause remember when you're in hypnosis, past, present, and future coexist simultaneously. I use chronic healing psychotherapy. I use EFT tapping on the endpoints and the meridians to get it out of the amygdala and clear it out of the energy system. I even use our own form of EMDR called uh, bilateral hemispheric integration technique that releases those dramas and traumas in a state of hypnosis in the core level. So once we get it down to zero, and that's what we're looking for, get it to zero, then we reprogram brain and body. That's the final step of the method to create new neural pathways, anchor in positive beliefs, and allow people to go on and create the kind of life they want. So thank you very much for letting me speak. I appreciate it.